Hello, everyone, and welcome to Police Off the Cuff Real Crime Stories. I'm your host, retired NYPD Sergeant Bill Cannon, a 27-year veteran of the NYPD. Folks, before I get into tonight's show, which is going to be a blockbuster, I have to bring up one thing. And on the screen, you see this police officer was just murdered the other night in New York City in the far Rockaway precinct. I believe it was the, the 101. He's 31 years old with a wife at home and a, a young child. And heartbreaking. He only has three years on the NYPD. And the NYPD are doing their job right now with one hand tied behind their back because of politics. It's just disgraceful what has happened to that city. It went from the safest large city in the world to what we see now, which is disgraceful. And I'm disgraced, and every cop that ever wore the uniform is disgraced as what to happen, what happened to this young officer, Jonathan Diller. Lost his life to two career criminals that shouldn't even have been out of prison. Nevertheless, carrying guns and looking to, to commit more crimes. So, folks, I just want everyone to say a prayer for his family, his soul, and for the NYPD that they can move on bravely as they always do for Dulles Ed Mortem. So tonight, guys, we're going to talk about, of course, the Madeline Soto case. and. We've covered this case a great deal, but tonight I have two special guests. Of course, one of them you see all the time, Professor Mike Geary, but I have a superstar guest in Barbara Butcher, one of the most experienced medical legal investigators in the world. In the world, yeah. Has been to over 680 homicide scenes, attended over 5,000 autopsies. And just recently, if you caught it, she's on the Netflix a blockbuster hit, I'm told so far. I, I watched three out of the four, three out of the five episodes so far. It's called uh, Homicide New York. They can't come up with new names. There was another show, New York Homicide. They're confusing people. But I watched it. It's a lot of the cases I know, a lot of the detectives I know, and of course I know Barbara Butcher. So I had to give her that plug. She's also, in case you don't know, the author of this book you see on the screen, What the Dead Know. Another, uh, I read the book and I couldn't put it down. And I'm not just saying that because I have Barbara on the show and because I truly like her besides her being talented and a fantastic author, actress, you name it. She does it all. Anyway, uh, the book is available on Amazon, uh, What the Dead Know. And I, it's, it's also a, a blockbuster. Anyway, folks, we're going to dig deeper into the Madeline Soto case. And we're going to talk about the case because we do have uh, Barbara Butcher on the show. So hang on to your hats. Hang on to your seats. You're about to enter true crime from a police perspective. You're about to enter the off-the-cuff zone, the police off-the-cuff zone. There has to be some common sense. Yes, sir. They have the car stopped in Tampa Ranch, Michael Biden. We still don't know who pulled the trigger. Folks, without further ado, I'm going to get our guest and our co-host on as quickly as possible. You see him all the time. He loves being on camera. He happens to be a professor of criminal justice at Albertus Magnus College in Connecticut. He's also a retired NYPD sergeant and attorney, and he hears confessions also if, you, if, you're, sinner, if you're a sinner. Anyway, welcome to the show, Professor Mike Geary. Hey, Billy. Thank you for that amazing introduction. Thank you. And welcome everyone to the show. Mike, I had to do something because, you know, Barbara's getting all these accolades. I couldn't have you, you know, shrinking down in your seat. Anyway, I introduced her before, but I introduce again the great, wonderful Barbara Butcher, one of the most experienced medical legal investigators in the world, was once the chief of staff of the New York City Office of the Chief Medical Examiner. Welcome to the show, Barbara Butcher. Welcome, Barbara. 
Thank you so much, Bill. Hey, Dr. Mike, good to see you. you? How's everybody? Great. You know, Barbara, we love having you on the show. And when I saw you on Homicide New York, I was like, oh, my God, she's fantastic. (laughs) And you really should be an actress. I told you you could be a stand up. You could do whatever you want. Anyway, I'm thinking about stand up. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm on episodes one, two, and five of uh, Homicide New York. But all the episodes are really good. It's a fantastic show. Absolutely. So let's let's get to this case, Barbara. And and one of the questions that everyone has, of course, is when are they going to pull the trigger on this this savage right here, John uh, uh, Stefan Stearns? Uh, when there's there was his formal charges that they're holding him in jail right now 60 counts of we'll say sa but one of the things that everyone of course is waiting for barbara and we're shocked because they would never do this in new york city mm-hmm. it's 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 uh we believe the murder took place on on february 26th the body was found on march 1st and they still haven't made an arrest in it because he's not going anywhere so they have that luxury of, you know, pro, uh, crossing their T's and dotting their I's, which isn't always the luxury you have in this kind of business. But he's not going anywhere. What are your thoughts on that, Barbara? Um, you know, I think this is, as you said, this is a luxury. They've got them. They've got them to rights on these other charges, these uh, these sixty something essay um, charges, which are. <laughs> Let me let me just say something here. I am so appalled and so sickened by this that I can barely speak about it. But you know, I would do anything for you, Bill. So, well, thanks. I'm, for it. I'm but I am so sickened and so appalled by the um, evidence that they've mentioned. And so, one, you know, you have to wonder. Well, he dropped her off at school, supposedly took her to school that morning. He, she never got there. And then the body is found in a place where he was reportedly uh, fixing a flat tire. So why aren't they made an arrest? Well, I, I think in this case, the medical examiner has a lot to do with it. Uh, as you know, the autopsy findings are going to be a wealth of information. For instance, the cause and manner of death. We can probably say homicide with some degree of of certainty. And yet people will say things like, well, what if the little girl took drugs and overdosed and and someone just took her body there? Or if what if the little girl, uh, you know, fell off a roof? I mean, you, you can go on endlessly in speculation. But the likelihood is that that this poor little child was 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 a victim of a homicide. So why haven't they charged him? Well, when the medical examiner does an autopsy, not only do they test for everything, you know, toxicology, tissue testing, um, everything you can think of, but they have to get past something here, which is pretty awful. And that is the fact that the body was not found between February 27th and March 1st. So that's four days of being out in the open in Florida, you know, the weather, there's going to be some degree of, of, of decomposition. Um, she was out, I believe, in a field. So there's going to be some evidence of, um, of you know, animal um, activity. Activity, yeah. And insect, insect and animal. So what does that mean? It means we don't have a clear cut. Uh, a bruise or a, a stab wound or a gunshot wound that we can look at. You know, you and I would go in on a case and you see guys laying in his living room, gunshot wound to the head, stab wound to the heart. But in the case of a decomposed body, we said apparent wounds. We didn't say gunshot wound. We didn't say stab wound. We said apparent because when a body is in that state, it's very, very difficult to give an accurate answer. And in a case like this, you you have this luxury of waiting and you don't want to slip up in the least little detail. So you can be assured that that medical examiner and the police are going to go over every aspect of the examination, every bit of the toxicology testing and histology until they have a definitive answer. 
Barbara, if you uh, responded to that scene in the situation that you just described, as a medical legal investigator, and I mean, I know what you do because I've been there, <laughs> but I want you to tell all listeners, what are you going to that scene? First of all, you're going to check that scene out after crime scene has done all their work. They've done their photographs, right? You don't mm, want to. No, not necessarily. Not necessarily. I don't know if you recall, but, you know, I used to bitch about the fact that crime scene would get there, would do their photos, and sometimes they'd move the body. And I'd get there and say, well, look, you've contaminated my examination now. So I built relationships pretty quickly where the guys knew to wait until I got there because I'd have, we'd, we'd both do our photographs before anything was moved. And then together we do the body examination. And as I did the exam, I would point out you know, here's, a, you know, an abrasion ring from a possible entry wound and expose it so they could get a good photo there. And then together we do that. So nobody lost any evidence. Nobody lost any uh, chance to observe the body in its original found state. So if I showed up at that scene in Florida, I would fully expect that police would have cordoned off the area declared the crime scene in, in as great as an expanse as was needed. And that crime scene would be waiting for me. Or I'd be, if I got there first, I'd wait for crime scene. I wouldn't start messing around with anything. And then together, we would do our photos and then work our way inward to the body and to what we could find there. Um, you know, how many times have you been on a scene where they're, you know, they're, it, it, people trample in, especially when you're out in the field or out in the dirt. You're going to be looking for footprints, for shell casings, discarded cigarette butts. If everyone's walking in to the body directly, we're going to lose things. So in, in my view, um, you know, if that were my, my case, I'd go in and with Crime Seed, we'd do our photos. Then what are we looking for? We're first assessing the scene. Obviously, we have an outdoors area, a field. We'd want to know the temperature of the days preceding her, the body being found. We'd want to know the rainfall because all of those things affect our findings, especially temperature. You know, if it was three 90-degree days in a row, we know we're going to have a great deal of, of decomposition. Then... We start with the body. We do the overall shots and we start examining, looking for wounds. Now, unfortunately, if you're looking for something like strangulation, you know, there are certain marks we look for, um, finger marks or a ligature mark. Unfortunately, decomposition changes the color of the skin, can make it dark, make it purple. Now it's difficult to see abrasions, but in the autopsy room, by fine dissection and by tissue histology, looking under a microscope. Now we can see, is there bleeding into the outer layers of the skin, indicating a bruise? We can look for the hyoid bone, that little thin wishbone in the neck that is fragile enough that when someone is manually strangled or strangled hard with a, uh, with a ligature, it will often fracture. So, after we do the front of the body, we're going to gently turn her over and now look at the back. We're going to record the clothing. Was it the clothing she left home in or was it some other clothing? Um, and what's on that clothing? Any stains, any rips, tears, holes? Then we're going to go for the fingernails and take a quick look. Is there anything under the fingernails? Did she fight? Is there any flesh or hair? So of course, we're going to check that for DNA. So we bag the hands carefully with paper bags, not plastic, because plastic bags will keep the moisture in and then there will be further decomposition. So we put paper bags over the hands, tape it at the wrist with evidence tape. Um, anything we find on the body that might have that might fall off during transit, We'll carefully remove with, t with uh, tweezers and put into um, 
small evidence envelopes. Again, paper, no plastic. And so there we go. Um, it's a slow, meticulous process. And at the end of that exam, do I stand up and say, well, this is obviously a homicide and uh, there's every likelihood that she was strangled? Nope. We wait. Now we wait. We wait for the autopsy. We wait for toxicology. We wait for histology. We wait for statements from witnesses and perpetrators. You know, suppose we made a snap judgment and said, well, this is a homicide and this child was strangled. That's, uh, that's our evidence because we don't see any gunshot wounds and we don't see any knife wounds. Then we get an autopsy and it turns out there's no evidence of strangulation, but there is evidence of chloroform or cyanide or some poisoning. Now, we've already let out this information into the atmosphere. And now when we go to trial, don't you know there's going to be a, a excuse me, Dr. Gary, but some lawyer is going to stand up and say, wait a minute now, didn't your original investigation reveal that this was a, this was a, uh, a strangulation death? Now you're telling us, oh, no, no, there's this evidence of cyanide in the blood. So that's why we don't make announcements until every bit of evidence is in and we've examined everything we can. But they do have that luxury here. He's not going anywhere. Right. But, you know, Mike, I want you to ask a question because okay, uh, I got some questions. You'll never get in there. <laughs> no, no. This is like, this is murder crime scene 101 for me. I'm just remembering all kinds of stuff from the Bronx and Manhattan. Thank you. This is great. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I do talk a lot. No, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, Barbara, one of the things, and of course, what you mentioned also is that the science of investigation, that is your part of this. <clears throat> the art of investigation is the detectives. And not that it doesn't cross over, but yeah. by art, I mean the police work, mm -hmm. the, the gumshoes, going out there and asking questions, interviewing people. And some of the things that they found out of course, uh, from digital information. Yeah. This dirtbag, right, at 7.35 in the morning, as seen by a dumpster in their condo complex, throwing her backpack and her laptop, for her school <laughs> laptop, into the dumpster. That's at 7.35 in the morning. At 8.19, he's seen coming back into the complex with what appears to be her dead body in the car. This is all from video, the police reporting. Mm. And this was from a press conference that a, a Chief Mina said mm. that it appeared that she was dead in the car. Now he goes and takes that 17 or 20-something mile drive to where he dumped her body. So right now, I mean, to me, I already have probable cause to lock him up, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And the fact that you know they're not saying... Well, they, they slipped a couple of times. They said, oh, the murder investigation. Or this. Mm -hmm. But they're not. The medical examiner is the person that determines it. As, as you, you, of course, know yeah. that when we talk, and I explain this every time, manner of death, homicide, suicide, accidental, uh, natural, or undetermined. Right? Mm -hmm. so five ways. The, the, and the medical examiner is the arbiter of that, determines this is a homicide. But... John Q. Citizen and John Q. True Crime Watcher, I think everyone knows this is a murder. This yeah. is a homicide, you know? And we're just waiting. And impatiently, we're mm -hmm. waiting. And the next thing is the cause of death. And of course, blunt trauma, gunshot wound, asphyxia, you know, strangulation, uh, poisoning. Could could be a drug. They could have forced her to, to ingest drugs. Sure. Or, so that's why... Part B to this is the toxicology, which can take from six to eight weeks yeah. to come back. But the autopsy should be done already, obviously. And I think yes. the ME, of course, knows at this point uh, the manner of like, the, the manner and the cause of death. But, but they're not saying right now. Yeah. You know, it's tempting. It's, it's, it's so hard to be patient in a case like this when you're so horrified and angry by the nature of the case. 
everything in me would want to just say, just charge them with murder, charge them with everything. Um, charge them with bank robbery too while you're at it because this yeah. is so sickening. So it's tempting, but we have the time. So why not go buy the book? Well, let's go beyond the book because again, yes, someone carrying a backpack out and throwing it into a dumpster, someone carrying what appears to be a lifeless body, uh, a child that appears lifeless in a car, that also can work for, oh, the child took drugs. You know, someone said, oh, you know, she was a, a known junkie or some ridiculous statement. But until such time as we have a manner and a cause of death, why blow it? Absolutely. You know? you know, Barbara, I, from, the chat, from the chat, this woman, Mayhem and Miracles, I'd like to know why they assume she was passed when they seen her in the car. Can panel give their opinion? Thank you. Barbara? Yeah, I mean, sure. Slumped over. Um, I don't Do they have video of him carrying her? No, they have video of her in the car, which, you know, and it's also going mm -hmm. through a window. So it, it, it must have been incredibly good video if yeah. they were making this opinion known that she appeared to be dead at that yeah. point. And this is him coming back into the complex before he drives out to drop the body off. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, that's the also the thing with this whole case that's a, really getting people, well, we have no right to be annoyed, but that's we are because we yeah. want to know the answers is that we don't know everything the police know. And they know a lot. They that's know right. a lot of things. And a lot of things, of course, we see on the true crime people, there's a lot of just conspiracy theories, what ifs, mm -hmm. what is, what is, shoulda, could is, and um, they know the answers. And you know, it's the, it's the part of putting the art and the science of investigation together and coming up with good conclusions. Absolutely, there's, I mean, the advances in forensics are extraordinary. DNA and and touch DNA and genetic genealogy and and the videos that are now everywhere, the cameras, um, that is has advanced things uh, by light years. But there is no substitute for good old fashioned on the street investigation. Um, you know, I'm just thinking of. of that show, the, the, the murder, New York, a homicide, NYC, and guys like Rob Mooney or, or detectives like Irma Rivera. Oh, who she's just great. Went, she's fantastic. You sit and you talk to people and you listen and you listen again and you listen for four hours until they say the thing that steers you in the right direction. And it's, it's, there is absolutely no substitute for that and never will be. You always need an experienced detective who has the art of communication with perpetrators and victims and families that can pick up those little nuances of what people say and the way that they say it. 100%. So, you know, I want, Barbara, I want to show a little bit of this because this has mm. got everyone crazy. And this is the dirtbag appearing on TV acting like he's really sorry, and this is before they found her body. Mm -hmm. Gerritin looked fine when I drove away. It's the last time we saw her. What were the conversations that y'all had in the car when you dropped her off? Not much. She was asleep for most of the way. Told her, have a good day at school when she got out, and I love her. She said, thanks, love you too. What was it? And so where, where, where do you think she could possibly be? I mean, this isn't, as I was told, this isn't normal behavior. This is not normal behavior. She's not the type that would just run off. We don't know where she can be. And we're scared. We just want her home. Are you, in a sense, blaming yourself? It's hard not to. Why? I dropped her off early. I could have waited longer. She looked okay. She was walking towards the school when I saw her. It was like any other day, so I went on with my day. It's hard not to blame myself. What has the conversation been with Jen since? She's been very, a lot stronger than me. 
And then when the game is really well, and, uh, and it just keeps coming in waves, this reality keeps hitting. We don't know where she is. We don't know if she's safe. We're just scared. We just want to. He was wiping away a non tear. Right. There's no tears, but he, this is part of his Oscar winning yeah. performance that he's trying to give there. Two things I notice. One is that he's using the crying voice as if his throat was choked up. You know, that's kind of easy to do. But there's nothing in his eyes. His eyes are not tearing. The, there's nothing on his eyelashes because it's hard to make yourself, you know, shed tears. But anybody can make their voice sound like they're crying. Right. So that's number one. Number two, his eyes. When they ask, he looks down, he keeps looking down. And then he says to himself, you got to look up. And he looks off to the side. So his eyes are down. His eyes are off to the side. He's just, look, if anything, God forbid, a thousand times happened to any kid I know or in my family, I would be screaming into the camera, someone please help us. Right. I would be hysterical. This guy is just making up a little story. Yeah, you know, she was asleep in the car. Huh, interesting. You know, how convenient is that, Barbara? Because, yeah. you know, covering himself in case they got that on video, she yeah. was in the car, you know? Covering yeah. as Professor Geary, and he's not thinking right right now. Consciousness <laughs> is real. <laughs> I got it. Car, Mike. I got it. <laughs> well, say it. Consciousness <laughs> of guilt. Yeah. Yes. Let, let, me, let me continue with this, and then we'll... You like literally put boots on the ground, went out. Yeah, I even went out with the cops uh, where I had dropped her off. And we looked all up and down the road, all on communities, and there was nothing helpful. None of the cameras were pointing the street. Nothing, which in 2024 was surprising. The church across the street had some cameras, and they mentioned seeing her waiting around in the parking lot for a while before moving on and that was it but it was grainy it was grainy footage and not much not much else does it seem like she walked west east uh, they said in the direction of the school i'm not sure what that is what was the language not language verbally language body language when you drove through all that she seemed happy was happy. she like i'm going to meet she my friends happy. She got a happy weekend. She just turned 13. She had a 13th birthday party. I thought she was she sleeping. We were all together here. And she's just very happy. She was a happy kid. She's very sweet. She's a very sweet girl. She brings a lot of joy to us. And we just, just not knowing. So the unknown is killing you. Yeah, it's like our whole world is upside down. I'm not feeling her presence here is I'm sorry. It's hard. I know you're fine. Don't you need to apologize. Um what do you want our viewers to know when they see some when they see this? She's a sweetheart. She's a very sweet, kind girl. He just spoke in the past tense. I don't know if you noticed that. <laughs> He was a very right. sweet girl, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, we can read into that too. Just please be nice to her. Bring her home if you find her. Tell her that we love her. Wherever she is, I hope she's okay. I mean, if someone were to come in contact with her and you gave me her diagnoses, would it be easy to approach her without any like agitation or anything? Yeah, yeah, she's, she's a good kid. She's a good kid. If you can sum up in one complete sentence, waking up, getting ready to drop her off at school, dropping her off at school, to now speaking to me after talking to the police about her being missing for over 24 hours right now. In one complete sentence, what would that be? A living nightmare. It's a living nightmare. Day started off like any other. You know, I just want to wake up. You just get hit with waves of the reality. Just it's setting in. 
soon as it got dark last night, we really, we started falling apart. We knew it wasn't going to come to an end. And now we're going on 24 hours and still nothing. It's conflicting reports here and there. People say they see this or that. None of it's conclusive and none of it's helpful. We I think you get the point. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, Barbara, the, I, I'm not going to show the mother, but the mother is also extremely deceptive. And in my opinion, uh, a mother whose name is Jennifer. Mm -hmm. I believe the mother's involved. I really do. I've said it I mean, sometimes that this was the same interview. You see the picture. That's the mother, uh, Jennifer Soto. Mm -hmm. Now, this guy lived with them on and off for like five years. So this SA had been going on since this little girl was eight years old. Mm -hmm. Horrific, horrific SA. And people in it that are listening know why we're using essay and not the actual uh, words. Mm -hmm. But this poor little girl was <clears throat> for like five years and they found in her phone that she said, I can't wait till I'm 13 because I'm going to run away and uh, live in the woods. Mm -hmm. 13 year olds don't say that unless their home life is absolutely horrific. Yeah. Your thoughts? Well, <clears throat> In the cases that I know of, in which there was a child uh, essay ongoing in a home with other adults, the other adults were aware. Um, I don't have extensive experience in this, probably four or five cases. Um, <clears throat> but in each of those cases, the mother was aware kind of hard not to be but now you know, denial that's, that, that's my whole question to you right now <clears throat> is would the level of sa in this case and we saw 60 charges against this savage right mm -hmm. could it even be possible that the mother didn't i say no i say absolutely no there, I think there's no way anything is possible to quote jimmy turnbull isn't it possible that, you know, meteors came out of the sky and all kinds of things? Um, anything's possible. Probable? No. But for instance, if the mother was at work when the essay occurred or, um, but no, but wait a minute. In each of the cases I know of, the child acted uh, in a way that would indicate that something was wrong. Now, the children in these cases, and I, I think, Dr. Gary, you can speak to this a lot more than I can, but um, they're usually threatened that if you tell anyone, then you'll be taken away, you'll be put in an orphanage, your parents will, will go to jail, uh, no one will speak to you, you'll be dirty. Um, they're told all kinds of things. And it's very, very frightening for a child. And the child learns to detach it happens to them, and then they take their mind somewhere else. Um, but in each of the cases I know, what happened is a younger sibling started to be victimized as well. And that's when the older child said, I, I have to put a stop to this. Uh, <clears throat> and, you know, I'm thinking about these, Jesus. One was a friend of mine, you know, who even as an adult could never forget that that horror. Um, so I, I think that a mother knows their child. And if a mother doesn't hear anything or see anything, they still know that something is wrong with their little girl. Maybe they're not doing as well in school. Maybe they're sulky. Uh, you know, maybe they act nervous. Who knows? But it's hard to imagine that no one knew anything was going on. It's you know, hard. Barbara, this also <clears throat> passed the level, and I'm not going to get graphic because that passed the level of SA to, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, it was much worse than that. Yeah. Uh, to, to the point where I was surprised that on the, her annual physical, mm -hmm. the doctor or some medical professional didn't see signs of this. 
Yeah, but you know how it is with pediatricians. You bring in your kid for a checkup, an 11, 10 year old, and the child is a little shy. They don't pry. They'll just check a brief external look to make sure there's normal development of genitalia, breasts, et cetera. And, um, but they don't go too deep, so to speak. Um, you know, cause it's hard for a kid and unless the child says I have a problem, right. Then they're not going to look. So unfortunately that's the nature of that. You know what they found on the phone as I understand, was beyond horrific. And just for those who might think, oh, it's not real. You know, that's that's not true. How could that happen? How could that be? Many years ago, um, I did a case where I went into a home. The guy was sitting at his computer uh, naked and dead. And, um, you know, all around him were boxes and shelves of files, and they contained... Uh, folders and videos and uh, DVDs all lined up and labeled with codes. So I was interviewing a neighbor. I asked her if she'd do the identification. And I said, tell me about the guy. She said, oh, he's a lovely man. So nice to the children in the building. Always giving them lollipops. A very, very sweet man. And I said, okay, that's nice. Give me the name. There you go. Now, he had been sitting in front of the computer um, pleasuring himself and we couldn't see anything on the computer. The screen had already gone dark and we didn't have a code. But I said, let's just take a look in some of these boxes here and see what this guy's into. The things I saw were unbelievable. This was not small adults. This was not teenagers acting like children. This was little tiny children, toddlers with adults. And the photographs, the tapes, the videos were all there. And the sickness that washed over me w was just horrifying. I can never forget that feeling. Um, there is, I wanted to think that these were like setups that, you know, they used uh, short people or, you know, now nah, it's real. It's real. No, Robert, it's just evil. you saying this, I can feel... The PTSD yeah. from your body and hitting me because I have it too. And yeah. I think Mike, Mike probably has it too. Sometimes, and yeah. I think most smart people admit that they have it, you know. Yeah. And it, for with me, it's not anything horrific. It's just sometimes I'll wake up with um, yeah. bad, bad pictures in my head. I'll mm -hmm. put it that way. What you're sure. just describing, I'll wake up and, and or relive or have, you know, a, a uh, more of a fear of violence like happening to yeah. me or someone in my, my family because my family yeah i've seen so much violence you yeah. know and like as you're saying that i'm sort of oh i can feel it yeah uh, it comes back to you right you yeah. never forget that feeling that no. that horror the realization of how evil people can be the extraordinary evil not just to harm a child physically in that way but to destroy innocence. And to me, yeah. that is one of the greatest sins in the world is the destruction of innocence, the destruction of love, of belief, of trust. That is disgusting. Yeah. And look, I, if I, I'm glad I wasn't in law enforcement because I would have killed so many people. I really would have. You know? It's tempting. <laughs> Mike are, you, Mike, are you on the same page as this? Are you feeling the same? Yeah. Um, as you're talking, I'm thinking back to some of the child abuse cases that I handled and how uncaring the parents mm -hmm. turned out to be, how mm -hmm. out of touch with reality they turned out to be. Um, they're, they're, they were narcissistic, self-centered. The children were, ah, they're there, but nobody's mm -hmm. really concerned. Um, and... Sometimes, uh, as you talk, like some of the things that come from the child. <clears throat> I remember uh, crossing the school children at 187th Street and uh, Webster Avenue by the school that uh, near my, on my footpost, and this boy started talking in such a vulgar and disgusting way. He must have been like in fifth grade. He was a little mm -hmm. kid, and I could hear him talking to this girl in such a disgusting manner, using adult four-letter words, and 
saying what he was going to do to her. Mm. And um, I'm crossing the kids as I'm hearing this, and I'm, you know, and I started thinking. First, I was shocked. The second thing I started thinking, where is she getting that language? And the, yeah. the, the, it was some specific sexual suggestive remarks that he was making. I'm like, okay, this kid's been exposed to pornography. Mm-hmm. And I'm really thinking to myself, you know, like, I, I re- really want to know what the heck that kid is going home to. What are they being exposed to by their mother and by their father? And in a way, I felt actually, I was, I was angry at the kid, but I also felt sorry for the kid because obviously there is a self there's a very destructive home there. And I'm sure that kid did not have a normal uh, childhood. But I start thinking about those sorts of things. I start seeing the images of Kate taking the kids to the hospital. Mm. And the parents. I got screamed at by, by, by uh, mothers who said, and I'm taking their child to the hospital to, to um, save their lives. And they're screaming at me. I'll have your job for this. You can't take my child away from me. You're going to get fired. And I'm sitting there like, oh, like what planet are you on? Yeah, yeah, I'm thinking about this as you're talking. Yeah. 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 Unbelievable. Let me just go to a quick commercial, guys. This is police off the cuff of real crime stories. If you like real crime, true crime from a police perspective, you're in the right place. And if you're not subscribed to us, go on our YouTube, hit that subscribe button, give us a thumbs up. Hit the like button. Share us with your friends and your family. We are the Police Off the Cuff family. If you want to contribute to us financially, we have a Patreon with three different levels. And we also have a YouTube channel membership with count them five different levels. And we appreciate all of our friends, our fans, and our subscribers that keep this show going and enable us to get amazing guests like Barbara Butcher and either, even, even Father Mike here, you know, to bring him on the show. But... Barbara, you know, someone asked from the chat, and I just want to answer this, uh, Rogerio Brito. In cases like this, do the police interview her school friends too, being them just kids? I think the answer is yes, but can they deny being interviewed if they feel traumatized? Rogerio, they absolutely do. It's called victimology. They absolutely do a deep dive on the victim, and that includes interviewing the friends uh, because – and if the people don't want to be interviewed, certainly the police can't force anyone to be interviewed. But usually in cases like this, the, the best friend knows the most about mm-hmm. what's going on in the life of a friend. And that is one of the reasons why victimology, the study of the victim, and do that deep dive into the victim's background. Yeah, so important. Um, and... You know, I, I can't blame a parent who would say, I don't want my child interviewed, but, you know, the parent should be there and uh, if they feel that way. And then you just assure them that we just want to know, do they have anything to contribute toward the life of their friend? Like, what did, what was their friend's life like? Um, and don't forget, these kids know their friend is missing. So they know something's wrong already. And they want to be of help. It's a way to forestall fear, I think, to be of help. 100%. Which I would say applies to the three of us, too. Yeah. <laughs> you know, one of the ways we get rid of our fears is by going out there and fighting against the, uh, the evil, evil forces. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, I want to play a little bit. This is the chief of uh, Kissimmee Police Department, uh, Chief Betty Campbell. And about six days ago, she gave a press conference, which we said was really a little bit of a nothing burger, but she made a few, what I would refer to as Freudian slips, and gave a little bit of information, oh, very, very little. But let's listen to a little bit of this. I don't have anything new that you don't already know, other than our detectives are working tirelessly day in and day out to ensure, you know, all the facts are uncovered in this investigation. Chief Holland, is, is the mother a suspect or a person of interest in this investigation? And also with the videos that you uncovered, is there any evidence of the mother's involvement on any of these videos? So everyone that was close to Madeline is considered suspect until we have proven otherwise. So the, she gave a little bit there, a, a little bit like everyone close to her hmm. is the suspect until we clear them. But you know, it's not a lot. It's not a smoking gun, but... Is the look, I, I gave my feelings early on, and I've been in the chat a lot of times, and especially, you know, believe it or not, as you know, Barbara, 
I think 77% of our audience are women on this show and most true crime shows. Mm -hmm. So I got to be careful, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they can beat me rather easily, but I have to be true to myself too. And when I feel something, I, I'm going to say what, what I feel regardless if my mm -hmm. audience doesn't feel the same thing. Yeah. And I really feel that this mother, and we spoke about, could she be involved through omission? Yes. But no commission, maybe, but omission, certainly. Yeah. And, and go ahead, Barbara. No, I just want to say, I, I, you know, I don't want to accuse anyone of anything without evidence. But I'm just saying my feeling that it would be hard not to know something was wrong with your child if over a five-year period they were repeatedly victimized by your boyfriend, husband, whatever. It would Absolutely. be kind of hard not to know. So whether it's a sin of commission or omission or nothing at all, maybe maybe it was so well hidden, but I, I, I just can't imagine that. I mean, if my grandkids sneeze, I'm all over it. What's going on? Are you sick? You know, who, who was near you? you know? um, so I, I, I find it hard to believe you could live with your 13-year-old child and not know that something was going on. I feel the same way. You know, this also breaks my heart. And these are people in the chat who confess to things happening. Mm -hmm. to them. And I thank them for doing it because... It's very brave. And, and even in the way that they do it, perhaps maybe it, it'll help someone else come forward and someone else not suffer in silence. So Rosalind R., thank you so much. Mm. I was accused very young. Creepy grandfather. Wasn't around much. Horrible person. My mom and dad and aunts did not know. So poor mm. Rosalind suffered yeah. in silence for all those years. And there's others in the chat that have sort of uh, – it's sort of almost like a confession here. I don't know if it's because of Mike Geary, the father of Mike Geary's here, but uh, I didn't mean to make a joke of that. But um, but it's it's touching to me mm -hmm. that there's a certain level of trust here that, and I and I really appreciate it. But again, I feel your pain, you know, and I don't want to be like Bill Clinton. I feel your pain, you know. But I really do feel the pain that you, you, you're expressing, and for those that suffered in silence, try try to get help. You know, because it's it's a open sore that will always be there, you know, and I think it's important to get counseling or something that can relieve you of that pain. Hmm. It takes a lot of courage to speak up, but I think it helps. And I, I think it's it's so brave to speak up and, and to say what happened. Um, at least then, you know, you're not alone. Yeah. No, and, and, you know, Barbara, I had a when I was a patrol sergeant. I remember I had this case where this young uh, Hispanic girl was being uh, abused by her live-in uncle. Mm. And it, it, it was more than abuse, but it was happening since she was like 13 and she, I think she was like 17. And the reason she came forward is because she got a boyfriend. Yeah. And she told her boyfriend what happened. And he insisted she call the police and report it. So we got this case and we locked up the uncle. And don't you know the family was mad at their daughter mm -hmm. for reporting this? That, that it should have been kept in the house. Yeah. Like this was something the family could have taken care of, you know? Yeah. Like you're and, bringing shame on the family or something. Jesus. Yeah, when I heard there was no prostitution, I was like, are you kidding me? That poor little girl, you know? Mm. Like they believed her, but this was something they could have handled in house. It's <sighs> awful. It really is. It's awful. Yeah. You know, sometimes you double victimize a child, you know, once by right. ignoring and then again by brushing aside. And it's, it's unfathomable, but it happens every day. I've never been surprised by the amount of evil that there is in the world. It just no. keeps getting. You know. Not at all. Jackie Oliver, I feel very bad for Madeline. I was abused just like her. I was seven all the way to 14. Hmm. This isn't about me. This is about her. But I know how she felt. My heart goes out to this little girl. Jackie Oliver, thank you for that. Hmm. And uh, Again, as I said, I hope that you have gotten help for that or uh, sought counseling. 
because it's very important to do that and to 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 recover from something like that. It's very very tough, you know. Uh, hmm. It's it's just, and as I said, this is a, a you know a community here, and, and many people in the chat know each other and correspond and stay in contact offline. And I, I think it's a, a, a loving community. And it's when you hear these stories, it's just like, you know, I, my, again, I feel like I'm a cop again. You know, my heart goes out to you. But when the bell rings, I go, I got to go to the next job, you know. Yeah. And uh, that's that's what you did, Barbara, too. You know. Uh, yeah. Just so. turn off your feelings, move to the next. Yeah. Turn off your feelings, move to the next. And Jackie Alba, he did my sister the same way and only got 14 years in prison. But I thank God every day of my life, I still have my life. This little girl didn't stand mm. a chance. Mm. Jackie, thank you again. It's so, so horrific. And, and there's so many people walking around on the street that have similar stories to this. Horrific yeah. stories. And, uh, you know, we, we feel for you guys. Let me play again. Go back to the press conference. Play this from Chief Campbell. How close are we able to know what actually happened to Madeline Well, you know, this is a very sensitive and, um, you know, it's, it's very intricate. We want to make sure that we uncover every single fact and all the evidence before, you know, we don't want to put a timeline on it, basically, you know, because the detectives are very meticulous in what they do. And we want to be sure that everything is uncovered that possibly can. No, ma'am, we are still waiting on the medical examiner's report. Chief, do you believe was killed inside of the family's home or somewhere else? We're still uncovering all of those details. Um, I'm not going to speculate on that until we have the facts. Chief, can you tell us, tell us if Stephen Stern acted alone in all of this? We're still uncovering all the evidence. I don't want to speculate whether he was or not. Um, we will wait until the investigation, you know, is completed to make that determination. Has Stephen Stern said he acted, acted alone, or what has he said in interviews with you since he, we know he's in jail? Yes. What has he told you about other people's involvement, if any? He has invoked his right to a lawyer, so we have not spoke with him. Is there Chief, any time that you can expect an update for us? We probably need to ask you every single day, and we understand that you're working on an investigation, but we would like to give them I, I don't want to rush my detectives. I think it's paramount that they take their time. And, you know, Mr. Stearns is not going anywhere. You know, mm -hmm. you know Barbara, one of the things that I, uh, I said early on, I said, there's multiple crime scenes here. Yeah. And by that, I mean, there is uh, the place where she was killed, which they're not telling us. Mm -hmm. They're not telling us that. It could be inside the home, which I, I would bet is 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 probably the location where the murder took place. The his vehicle, absolutely one hundred percent a crime scene. He transported mm -hmm. the body. We know that. Did the murder take place in the car? Mm -hmm. The location she was she was dumped, and of course the body is its yeah. own crime scene. So we have at least four crime scenes there. But yeah. right now, of course, the police are not telling us where the crime scene was because, you know, all of this stuff is, you know, it's pretty much a secret right now. It's, yeah. uh, and, and, you know, everyone that follows this case is, of course, frustrated with this. But, that, you know, hey, tough nookies, as they say, right? <laughs> we don't have a right to know this stuff. Mm -hmm. We want to know, and the true crime community wants to know. And, as much as there is a victimology, there's something called the perpology. And that's sort of a canonism. I don't know if it's in any textbooks, but it's the study of the background of the perp. And they've uncovered more horrific stuff about this Stefan Stearns. Did you hear where he worked, Barbara? No. Disney World. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. Where do all pedos work, right? No, I shouldn't. No. Sorry. No. <laughs> They want to be around kids. So they want to be in a place they can be close. And I said to Mike, I said to everyone that did this show with us, he's got victims going back probably for 20 years yeah. all over the place. This is not his first victim. This guy is an absolute monster. Yeah. So, you know, they have to do 
you know, obviously this case is the most important thing right now. Mm -hmm. How about finding out what the history of this guy is and how many crimes he committed of this nature? Yeah. Where was the mother on that morning that uh, this, this person was driving her to school? Supposedly sleeping because she had worked all night. Okay. So yeah. she worked a night so, shift. So, yeah. She doesn't go to pick up the child till like 4.30 in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. And the school didn't have a mechanism in place where they would call you early and say your, your child didn't show up to school. Right. I understand so, that they're working on getting that now, you know. Well, they're going to the do that now after the fact, but yeah. they didn't have that mechanism like I think every school in this day and age should have that yeah. somehow connected to a computer where you immediately get a text message. Yep. Look, they have them, they have text blasts for everything else, right? Yeah. Yeah. Why can't they put the attendance sheet on a text blast, you know? But, you know, that's very telling. If the mother worked nights, there was perfect opportunity for him to right. do his disgusting deeds. And, uh, yeah, that certainly could be um, an opportunity. Uh, but still, still, I don't know. 100%. Carol Grayston, thank you so much for the two pound super sticker. A child's home should be its safe sanctuary. 100%. But sometimes the home is anything but that, depending on you know, a lot of the homes we've gone into mm -hmm. in our police careers. You know, I can tell you, I've seen roaches the size of cats in some of these, <laughs> uh, some of these homes that we went into. Uh, Virginia, hello. I've had a question for a bit. How did Madeline get home after the party? Or did she? Did she become unlifed as of the ride home never made it home new be here peace that's the million dollar question virginia hello we don't know specifically where she was killed and when we don't have those details because the body wasn't found we believed the murder occurred on february 26th and the body wasn't recovered until march 1st so there's a whole gray area there where we don't have answers, but the police do. But yeah. guess what? They're not telling us. They know. <laughs> they know these. I always remember the movie Serpico, and Al Pacino said, uh, someone asked him why did he become a cop? He goes, because I could see all these cops, and something happened in that building, and no one knew, but they knew. Mm -hmm. I remember, always remember that from Serpico, and that's not why I became a cop, but that's why he did, right? And uh, so interesting. Yeah. The, so the police do know. They know what, what happened. They mm -hmm. know what went on. In fact, now there was some other uh, podcaster that discovered some clandestine site where many dirtbags like Stefan Stern's meet. And it, it was somehow encrypted so they could do their dirty deeds on this site without being found out. I don't know how he found this site, but it was another podcast. I'm not going to play it because mm. he was on um, Law and Crime uh, and he was talking about it. That's important to the overall investigation to go deep into this guy's background, but not so much for this case because this case, you know, I think they know what happened. And as and we all said, they didn't discover all these photos and these 60 charges he's being charged with in his phone, they didn't discover this. They would have made this arrest already yeah. because they had probable cause pretty much, you know, when they saw those videos of her appearing to be dead inside his car, they had probable cause when they had video of him throwing her laptop and her, her backpack in the dumpster. They had all of that. And then what do they do? They bring him in because they know this this dirt big is our guy, right? And they ask, can we look through your phone? And what does he say? Oh, yeah. You know why? Because, well, my, go ahead, Mike. Oh, because he thought that he had cleaned his cell phone, put it back to factory settings. And he said to them, oh, I accidentally uh, reset my phone just the other night. Yeah. And he thought that was it. He, was, he didn't, wasn't bright enough to realize that he wasn't technically savvy enough to get away with it. Yeah. 
Yeah. I just love that statement. I accidentally did yeah. a factory reset on my phone. Yeah, yeah, I'm a, I'm a helpless dummy. Right. How many yeah. times do you factorly, fact, accidentally factory reset your phone? Come on. Never, never. Jennifer Fox, if she was killed in that home, they have all of the <clears> evidence <throat> that they do, then just how did her body get in the car without being seen by the surveillance or without someone seeing it? Great question, Jennifer. Guess what? I don't have the answer to that. I don't know how he got her in the car without anyone seeing it. He could have did it at night. He could have backed up and into, you know, and, you know, he could have did it under the cover of darkness or like when he dumped the body. Did he really have a flat tire or was that a ruse? So he had the cover. He could have his car covering him, taking the body out of it and dumping it in the field. And then he put up his hood and all of that stuff. So people are paying attention to the guy changing the flat, yeah. not to what he's doing. That's a, a police word. Police. I said it like the hall and sergeant I was. Uh, that's a ruse. You know, he did it to cover his ass because yeah. he's guilty. He's guilty. Even that itself, that he, someone saw him. That's why the police, the police were called by someone. Oh, he was changing a flat. And sure enough, when they see his car, he's got the donut on it. But did his other tire really have a flat? Or was he just doing that to cover the dirty deed? Mm -hmm. Well, he didn't cover his tracks enough. Ain't that a shame? You know, he did not. Um, Barbara, you know, I wanted to ask you, where would you, where would you think? If you had to guess here, just know what you know about this case. And again, your guess is as good as anyone else's. Mm -hmm. Where do you think the crime scene was? Where do you think she was murdered? In the house. Just a guess. But, you know, maybe he decided to make a visit in the night. And maybe you know, she's... I think the same thing. I think yeah. the exact same thing. Because <clears throat> supposedly, or the, the her birthday party was at her grandmother's house. And yeah. guess who was there? This this dirtbag was there, so I can't see it. It couldn't have happened there at the. No. So he, he probably took her home, and maybe, well, like a lot of people have said on here, I'm 13. This isn't happening anymore. Maybe she That's took right. a stand against, right. it. and I'm telling. In fact, I'm gonna, and maybe yep. that's what forced his hand. Yeah, and exactly. Again, I'm just conjecturing. I'm guessing, like everybody. You know, a lot of police work, a lot of investigation. I used to say, you know, detectives sit around and they do what's called, I used to call it hypothesizing and theorizing. Mm -hmm. uh, Phil Grimaldi would call it spitballing. <laughs> and one of my detectives, I'll have to use this joke, I use it all the time. I'd say, stop hypothesizing and theorizing and start typerizing your reports. <laughs> you <know? laughs> they hated when I said that, but I had to. <clears throat> so, but that's how you come up <clears throat> You guess, you, you theorize, you hypothesize. Well, what if this? What if? Well, I don't think this because we saw him here. And, and that's how you solve cases. Mm -hmm. You put all these great minds together, these investigative minds. And we used to have briefings because, you know, police work is a 24 7 operation. So if you have a, mur a murder uh, and the detour is going home, well, they're not going home. They're going to work overtime. The new shift's coming in. You got to debrief the new shift on everything you found out on the day tour. Yeah. And the same thing when the four to 12, the eight, the day tour may go home because they just worked eight hours overtime. So when the midnight comes in of fresh detectives, you have to debrief the whole new shift on everything you found out. And that is how police work is done. And that's how investigation is done. And I know you, Barbara, and the chief medical examiner or the pathologist doing the autopsy, he wants to speak to the detectives. In fact, the detective in the NYPD is required to be there. Yeah. And the NYPD, the detective, catching detective, must attend the autopsy. Yep. Uh, you know, really, it's sort of a no-brainer. Like, mm -hmm. why wouldn't? How is he going to testify if this ever goes to trial if he wasn't physically in the autopsy? So if you're queasy and can't do that, you can't be a detective. That's yeah. part of your job, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. In the autopsy. So when the doctor is explaining uh gun track or you know bullet track and or 
wound track or how many wounds. This is the wound that appeared to be the fatal wound. All of those things he has to not just explain, show the detective, right? Yeah. Show him this is where it is. Check this. I mean, I would, I've been on scenes with you and you've showed me wounds. Mm -hmm. Well, look, I, I remember you weren't there, but there was this one uh, case that I thought was a, uh, was a suicide. And because the guy had a gunshot wound under his, uh, and it went out the back of his head and into the wall. And I'm like, ah, this is suicide. And then the M the medical legal investigators got there. Oh, no suicide. There's a second gunshot wound in his ear. <laughs> 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 tells you right there. The, uh, the, you know, two gunshot equals murder, equals yeah. homicide, right? Yeah. Yeah. You can't pull the trigger twice. And yeah. what would have been, both of them would have been death, death mm -hmm. shots, you know. And so it's just, uh, yeah, it's. You, you come know. up with a hypothesis and then you either prove or disprove it. And you need every bit of evidence and every theory to be compared and discussed and endlessly turned over until you come up with the correct theory. And then there it is. You use your evidence to prove or disprove it. Um, you know, you said something before. Uh, Ah, sorry, I can't think of it now. Anyway, I forgot. Um, all right, you have a right. Jennifer Fox, I agree 100% that she never went home that night. I just posted in Court TV about the same exact thing. It just doesn't make sense that, well, no, excuse me. I believe she, she, he killed her in the house. Yeah. Uh, you know, so it would have been after the birthday party, sometime between that and the next morning. That it, That just makes sense. It doesn't make sense that something happened when she turned 13 years old. And Barbara, I think when I brought that up, you shook your head right. You That's know. what I wanted to say, yeah. It's, it's uh, it, in my mind, if I have to hypothesize something, she's home, he makes a night visit, and she's been thinking about this. When I'm 13, I'm a big girl, I'm gonna run away and live in the woods. Now she's 13, she just had her party. And this time when he comes to her, she says, I'm a big girl now, no more. I'm going to tell. I'm 13. And he flips out. And he gets angry. And something happens. It goes bad. It goes worse. And that's, if I had to come up with a theory, that's what I would say. And then he gets the body out of the house into the car. And then ostensibly drives her to school where she never shows up. Nor did he ever drive her to where he said he drove her to. And that right. was confirmed by video. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that's an excellent theory. You are enough three. Thank you for the $5 super sticker. They discovered Stefan was using the telegram app the night of Madeline's birthday. God only knows what that monster did to Maddie. That's what I was referring to. You are enough three. Yeah. I, that it's supposedly, um, encrypted so that other dirt mm. bags can be on it and the law enforcement people cannot uh cannot find what the guy was posting you know uh it's filled you imagine the savages that fill that site that yeah. just hang out it's on these disgusting sharing the, their evil deeds with each other just it's disgusting it's no. incredible it's you know someone re also rm sundown thank you for the ten dollar super sticker Jen missed the party due to work. Party pictures show it was afternoon. So Jen probably worked 3 to 11. So where was she after work? Did she meet Stefan somewhere and that's where it happened? You know, I'm not thinking, and, and again, I could be wrong, but I'm not thinking the mother specifically right. was involved in the murder. I just think she's more responsible through omission, through not seeing things that by law she had a duty to see and do something about. So, uh, Mike, if you could just explain omission in the legal sense. Okay. Yeah. There's acts of omission, criminal acts of omission in the acts of commission. We think of acts of commission are where you take a gun, you hold up a bodega, you climb into a window of a house that's not yours and steal something. You punch somebody, you shoot somebody. Those are acts of commission. But there are times when people neglect their lawful duties and those acts of are acts of omission an act of omission in this case would be a a parent uh, failing 
to, to supervise their child, to take care of their child. We see this a lot in child neglect cases where the, the person isn't being, the child isn't being beaten, but the child is injured because they're being deprived of food, uh, water. Um, you know, we see this in the Frankie case. You know, it, well, actually, that, I'm sorry, those are acts of commission, but acts of omission where you are failing to act when you are under a legal duty to. So you're a caretaker and you're not doing your job. So in this case, she that that failure to act is actually considered an act of omission for legal purposes. And so that's what it seems to be with the mom. Yeah, if you look at those videos of the mom and, and Stefan, you kind of get an uneasy feeling about the fact that she's actually kind of in some ways adopting his version of events. And we saw one video where she says, we dropped her off. And you're mm -hmm. like, okay, if that is true, that she's actually covering for him after the fact, she could be an accessory after the fact to murder. So she may actually commit an overt act uh, in furtherance of the murder, uh, you know, him getting away with it as, a, as an accessory after the fact. Or she may also have committed an act of omission uh, beforehand. So the way, depending on the way it goes um, and what, what the autopsy says and what the, uh, you know, the old blood analysis and everything shows and whatever other information they have, uh, she may be facing uh, some very, very serious charges herself. Yep. Very well said, Mike. Uh, you. You're showing your law degree. I am glad. <laughs> it was worth it. It was worth it. KL uh, Charlton. Barbara is the investigator I want working my case. If anything happened to me and the woman I would want in my circle of friends, she's fantastic. You know, we know that. That's why she's on the show. But you know something? She's retired from that. She's now living a life of an, an author and an actor and you know, she's doing what she wanted. She paid her dues as we did, you know. And we all agree she's fantastic. And But thank you, uh, K.L. Charlton, for praising Barbara. And I'm sure you know something. Flattery will get you everywhere, as they say. <laughs> thank uh, you, K.L. I hope I never I, – nothing should happen to you. Stay safe. Take yes, care of yourself. Um, yeah, I, I just – I can't do it anymore. I just can't. You know, I did private cases for a long time after I retired. And uh, – it broke my heart. You know, so many families who never got answers or got wrong answers. And uh, I just can't do it another day. I got you know, Barbara, a few years gave, left. You gave all you could give, you know, something. And we were all three of us, 9-11 first responders. That took yeah. a piece out of our hearts. And also, that accelerated it. You know, yeah. I think yeah. Rob Mooney said something. I forgot what he said, the, the exact quote. But basically it was like, you know, you're leaving a lot of you on the street, you know, I, it was the gist of it. And he said it yeah. correctly is that you, you know, we all have PTSD, let's face it. And that's mm -hmm. seeing the horrors that we've seen all over those years. Lynn Bernard, how do you believe he unalived her at the home? Cops saw when he threw her school stuff in the trash, but they never said they saw her getting in the car. They saw her dead in the car when he came. Look, Lynn, I don't know how he got her in the car without anyone seeing him. My theory is I believe he probably strangled her. That's that's the quietest way to kill someone. And if you're a big male, 200-something pounds, this little 13-year-old girl that maybe weighs 120 pounds, it's not so difficult to strangle them, to take their life in that way. And that's my, my guess right now. And it's a guess just like anyone else. Uh, that's just my feelings. I, I feel that it happened inside the home and he, somehow he got her into the car without anyone seeing and he did what he did, you know, and then he, he had to think of covering his tracks, covering his trail, which he, which he was doing by throwing her laptop and her backpack into the dumpster. Then, right. Well, well he, 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 look, most criminals are stupid, you know, yeah. because first of all, there's too many ways for us to catch you these days. You know, mm -hmm. you're not going to get away with things uh, the way people used to. There's video everywhere, folks. If you're looking for a great attorney in the New York <laughs> metropolitan area, then Joe Murray is your man. Joe's a retired NYPD police officer and a fantastic defense attorney. You can reach Joe on his cell, seven one eight five one four three eight five five. Email him Joe at jmurray-law.com. Go on his website jmurray-law.com. Not only is Joe uh, fantastic defense attorney, but he's a real huge supporter 
of the Police Off the Cuff podcast. There he is. So in case you're wondering what he looks like, that's Joe Murray. You know, Barbara, we covered so much of this case, and but we took a different tack. We took a different direction tonight, and it's all because of you. I mean, you did such a fantastic job. And, you know, as I'm saying to people, people want to hear something new every time. Sometimes we're doing what detectives do. We're doing what investigators do. We're hypothesizing and theorizing. Yeah. Only thing, we don't have to do any type of rising after this show. So, yeah. <laughs> but Barbara, I, I, I want to give you a, a, another plug also. Uh, Barbara's book, I want to put it on the screen, What the Dead Know. Uh, I read it in three days. I, I bought the book. I went to her book signing. I got to give her a kiss. Not everyone <laughs> gets to kiss the author of that book. I happen to know Barbara for years. So I, I bought a book and I got to give her a kiss. And I when I took it home, I read it. I couldn't put it down. And Barbara, I don't, I don't read a lot of books either. You know, I just happen to know a lot of shit. <laughs> <laughs> but I read that book because it was so good. It was so Thank good. And you. I noticed, and because I know you, I got to sort of peer into your soul. Uh, and the book, I'm not going to tell you anything about the book, give away any surprises, but there's a lot of pain in that book. Yeah. There really is. In fact, yeah. my brother read it, and he was like, oh, I want to call, but I go, fuck, take it easy. <laughs> I'm not calling her. <laughs> Send her an email. I, in fact, I even texted you. I go, Barbara, my brother wants to email you. Is that yeah. okay like sure sure yeah like, yeah, yeah. Get carried away you're not calling her but he was very touched by the book too oh, so that's good. uh barbara butcher what the dead know if you haven't seen the netflix uh homicide new york you can uh you can watch the whole thing in one night if you buff out you know, <laughs> have food and be, be there with your slippers and whatever she's fantastic on it she's just as clear and articulate on that show as she is here and I have to say, I love Barbara Butcher. I'm a big Barbara Butcher fan. And I love Bill Cannon. <laughs> Don't believe me, though. Go buy her book. Mike, <laughs> I'm going to give you your final thoughts. I, Barbara, I thought the show was fantastic. I hope that uh, everyone thank else you. did. I, I thought it was great. Uh, Mike, your final thoughts. I just want to thank everyone for tuning in. And I hope you've learned as much about crime scene analysis as, as I have tonight. So I just want to thank Barbara for coming on, discussing the actual you know, the actual hands-on crime scene, you know, synopsis analysis. Thank you very, very much. I, I really do appreciate that. That's fantastic. Thank you, Doc. Thank you both. Barbara, God bless. You, you, Barbara, you didn't let me do it. I was going to say, Barbara, your final words. Stay <laughs> safe. Love each other. Take care of yourselves. Love you. How could I object to that anything you said barbara thank you so much for coming on folks i'm bill cannon from police off the cuff thank you for tuning in have a great night everybody and be safe good night good night One episode, just